I notice some of the electronics are gone from the pulpit. I have no idea what that means. <laughs> I've gone a week and I come back and it's gone, but uh, that doesn't affect me, I don't think, at all. So it's good to be back and good to be with you. I want to continue on a lesson that I started two weeks ago, and uh, we will finish that up today, talking about building a firm foundation, and this will be the second lesson in that area. Again, I want to read from Matthew chapter 7, beginning in verse 24, the end of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. After teaching all the things that he taught there, he, made, he said these things. Now everyone who hears these words of mine and acts upon them may be compared to a wise man who built his house upon the rock. The rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew and burst against that house, and yet it did not fall, for it was founded upon a rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act upon them is like a foolish man who built his house upon the sand. The rains descended, the floods came, the winds blew and burst against that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. <clears throat> Any competent builder knows the importance of laying a firm foundation. When the foundation of a house moves, the walls tend to move also, and then the walls begin to crack. The doors don't close, and the foundation moves enough then the walls will begin to lean and possibly even fall down if they move enough. Jesus, in his Sermon on the Mount, used this construction principle uh, known to every builder to show the importance of certain foundational doctrines necessary for our lives, uh, living our lives for him and doing the work of his church. These doctrines must be based, of course, on the Word of God. You cannot build a strong house unless you've laid a firm foundation. And there are certain foundational teachings that are necessary before you can have a church built upon Jesus Christ. The Lord's house, our church, is built upon Jesus himself. Psalm 127 and verse 1 says, Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. When Peter confessed Jesus as God's son, whenever Jesus was asking, who do people say that I am, Peter st spoke up and said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, I say also that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not overpower it, Matthew 16 and verse 18. Of course, the rock was the fact that Jesus was the Christ, the son of the living God. In the last lesson on this subject, I looked at four foundational doctrines necessary to live a successful spiritual life. A successful spiritual life will be one that will get us into heaven at the end of this life. First, I talked about God being sovereign. Sovereignty means God is supreme ruler. Uh, God is creator and rules over all that he created. In our society, both young and old are constantly pounded with evolutionary theory from numerous sources and from what we call the good programs on television and from many that we think of as good books. For example, I take National Geographic. It has some wonderful information in it. It has great pictures, but it is very evolutionary in its theory, and so in order to really enjoy that book, I have to push that aside, and sometimes it gets kind of aggravating whenever I do that. But remember those school board members in Kansas who allowed the sacred theory of evolution to be questioned or challenged by intelligent design? This was about four or five years ago now. They were roundly condemned by the media and educators all over the nation. And also, they were defeated in the next election. Unintelligent design was reconfirmed, and the intellectuals were then happy as clams that that was true. So God is sovereign and rules over and created everything and rules over all he created. The second thing is that Jesus Christ must be the heart of our teaching. Uh, that was another point that I spoke three weeks ago. Without the foundational teaching of Jesus' completed work, all other teaching is vain. 
some of the, uh, in Corinth, some of the people challenged the resurrection. And Paul wrote back to the Corinthian church, and he said in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 13, but if there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised, and if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is vain, and your faith is also vain. In other words, if there's no resurrection, there really is no gospel. In verse 19, he said, if we have hope in Christ in this life only, we are of all men most to be pitied. And so it takes the gospel away whenever you take the resurrection away. The completed gospel of Jesus Christ must be taught under any and all circumstances. And third, I talked about the Bible as the inspired and inherent eternal word of God in its original manuscripts. Now it's true that we have none of those original manuscripts and I think that's a good thing. Otherwise, people would enshrine and worship those manuscripts rather than trying to obey what they said. However, we have hundreds of copies of those manuscripts which we can have accurate translations in our own language today. And the fourth thing I talked about is that Christ's church is distinctive and undenominational. The scriptures record Jesus building only one church. And I'm getting, getting back again to whenever uh, Peter confessed Jesus as God's son. And again, this verse that I read a moment ago. And I also say to you, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not overpower it. One of the ways Jesus' church is distinctive and can claim something that no man-made church can ever claim is that the gates of Hades shall not overpower it because Jesus overcame death and we can overcome death through him. In today's lesson, I want to look at four more foundational doctrines that we uh, must uh, keep sacred that cannot be abandoned. I want to look at some that are under attack in our culture from society and from some religious groups and churches that should be upholding them because they are in the Bible. These are foundational doctrinal principles that we must not abandon. The first one is that baptism is essential to salvation. Before the New Testament baptism was ever preached, Jesus taught that entrance into God's kingdom was through water and spirit. Nicodemus came to Jesus by night and uh, confirming his belief that Jesus was from God. In John 3, verse 1 and 2, it says there was a man of the Jews named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. <coughs> Excuse me. This man came to him by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Now Jesus immediately begins to tell him about entrance into the coming kingdom and the method of entrance. In verse 3, Jesus said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now this confused Nicodemus because he said to him, how can a man be born when he's old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? His confusion was because you were born into Judaism, into the uh, kingdom of God in Israel by just being born into the kingdom, being born of a Jew. And so he said, how can you do this again? But Jesus was talking about a spiritual birth. Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, but that which is born of spirit is spirit. And so we talked about water and spirit. Now, about three years later, Peter preached the gospel on Pentecost, and God's kingdom church came into existence at that time. And Peter, when he began to teach entrance into the church, said it was through water and spirit. In Acts chapter 2, after he teaches the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, 
And then it's saying, therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Some were convicted. When they heard this, they were pierced to the heart. And they said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, brethren, what shall we do? And Peter here talks about water and spirit. He said, repent and let each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So when they were baptized in water, having repented, having believed in Jesus, having confessed Jesus as their Lord and Savior, then they would receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And then he goes on to say in verse 41 that those that received his word were baptized and they were added that day about 3,000 souls. He also noticed, if you listen carefully to verse 38, taught that baptism was for forgiveness of sins. Peter said to them, Repent and let each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. He just said it and taught it. That's all there is to it. Baptism was understood from the very beginning to be immersion. The very word, baptizo, means to dip, to plunge, or to immerse. And it's illustrated this way. When Paul talked to the Roman, or wrote to the Roman church in Romans 6, 3 and 4, he said, Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death in order that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. So baptism is a likeness of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And when Jesus was buried, he was put into a tomb and he was sealed over, completely buried. And baptism is a complete burial in water. All other teaching in the New Testament harmonizes with these scriptures. Candidates for baptism are those who have reached the age of accountability, who have faith in, Je have faith in Jesus Christ and have repented of their sins. However, as we move on from the time of the founding of the church, about the 5th century, baptism began to change based on Augustine's false uh, doctrine of original sin. Baptism was still taught as necessary for forgiveness of sins, but original sin taught that infants were born guilty of sins and therefore infants needed baptism. The mode then changed from sprinkling, from immersion to sprinkling for infants, and then for confirmation at the age of whatever they considered accountability, and this replaced the need for faith and repentance before baptism. So there was baptism, and then there was confirmation later when the child or the baby grew up. This went on for many years like this. In the Protestant Reformation movement, uh, and the different teachings of men uh, that came out of that movement, that led in that movement, such as Martin Luther and John Calvin and Jacobus Arminius and John Wesley and a host of others, uh, brought a multitude of different teachings concerning baptism, and many of those are still among us today in many of the churches that came from that movement. Almost all of them differ from what Jesus and Peter and Paul taught. If you want the truth concerning baptism, you have to go behind all of that man-made teaching and go back to the teaching of the Holy Scriptures and see what the Bible has to say about it. During the period that is referred to as the Restoration Movement in America, teachers like Thomas and Alexander Campbell and Walter Scott and a number of others did go back to the Bible to search out these things that were necessary in order to have salvation, in order to uh, govern the church, and many other things. And they went back to God's plan for salvation, among other things. 
this restoration teaching often sets us in churches of Christ at odds with the uh, religious groups that are around us. Uh, but we must never surrender the truth for that reason or for any other reason. It is unfortunate uh, whenever preachers and elders and congregations back away from biblical teaching, from baptism, to gain popularity and acceptance of the people who are around them. When we stand in the judgment, popularity and acceptance from men will appear as nothing when compared with acceptance by Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. The Bible teaches that baptism is for forgiveness of sins and essential to salvation, and that foundational doctrine must not be abandoned. The second thing I want to point out in this lesson is that servant leaders are the ones who will change the world. James and John, not understanding the kingdom at that point in time, requested a position of glory on either side of Jesus. They said to him, Grant that we may set in your glory one on your right and one on your left, in Mark 10 and verse 37. This gave Jesus the opportunity to teach the importance of servant leadership. And we read in Mark 10, a little further down, verse 42 through 45. And calling them to himself, Jesus said to them, You know that those who are recognized as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great men exercise authority over them. But it is not so among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you shall be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. The church later rejected this teaching as it moved on in history and formed a hierarchical form of government uh, that led the church into apostasy. As we go to the Protestant Reformation movement again, leaders rejected this uh, Catholic form of government that had been built up through many years, but established their own hierarchies in various forms and in various kinds of organizations to replace it. Jesus demonstrated the importance of servant leadership in every way. Let me mention two. Jesus set a personal example for his apostles who would take his teaching to the world. At the Last Supper, they were still debating who was going to be the greatest among the disciples. It seems as though in this earlier event I've talked about, they hadn't really learned very much in Jesus' teaching. But they were still arguing about who's going to be the greatest, so Jesus gives them a demonstration to help them understand that. In John 13 and verse 3, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come forth from God and was going back to God, rose from supper, laid aside his garments, taking a towel, he girded himself about. And when he poured water into the basin, he began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. There was no servant there in order to wash the disciples' feet. And so Jesus himself takes the point of what a hired servant would normally have done and begins to do that to his apostles. Well, there's some exchange there, which I won't go into, but he then taught them concerning leadership in his coming kingdom as we look back in verse 12. So when he had washed their feet and taken his garments and reclined at the table again, he said to them, Do you know what I've done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right. For so I am. If I then, the Lord and the teacher, wash your feet, you ought to wash one another's feet. For I gave you an example that you also should do as I did to you. Never again do you hear them arguing about who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom. They finally got it. Jesus also demonstrated servant leadership when he went ahead and died on the cross. Paul wrote this concerning that. 
have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bond servant, being made in the likeness of me. And having been found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross, found in Philippians 2, 5 through 8. So we must never abandon the concept of servant leadership, but embrace it and use it in our lives. The third thing, the third doctrine that we need to never abandon is that the family must be nurtured and defended. Marriage for the sake of family was first organized, uh, was the first organized unit of society that God provided for the benefit of the human race. It's the foundation of society. It really forms the basis of the foundation for our society and for every other society in the world. Even before there was a mother and father to leave, God made this statement to Adam. Genesis 2.24, For this cause a man shall leave his father and mother, shall cleave to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Marriage was intended to be until death do us part, as we often say in the ceremony. When asked about divorce, Jesus made this statement. He said, What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. Matthew 19 and verse 6. This is the ideal. This is the way that it should be. For years, the foundation of marriage has been chipped away by certain elements in our society. But today, it's more than chipping. It's like somebody is taking a jackhammer to it. The very definition of marriage is being challenged, not just by divorce for any reason, but by so-called homosexual marriage. When fornication can be labeled marriage, we have come a long way down the road as we slouch toward Sodom. Self-proclaimed experts say things like this, and I'm not, this is not a quote, this is sort of a, a summation of some of the things I've been reading concerning marriage that so-called experts say. It is ridiculous to believe that one man and one woman should stay together for a lifetime. People need different mates for different purposes at different stages in their lives to meet their wants and needs. So what they're saying is that whatever your want and need is, when it changes, you just go and get somebody else to help fulfill that. If your need changes three or four times, then you would need three or four different mates. If, it, if you're one of those people whose needs change constantly, I guess you could have as many as 30 mates if you wanted to in your lifetime. I, I doubt even the experts, though, would go that far. But that's what they're saying, really. But God considered marriage so important that he used the institution to describe Jesus' relationship to the church. In Ephesians 5, 22 and 23, he said, Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to, the, as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, him, he himself being the Savior of the body. And then in verse 25, he says, Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all of her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and blameless. So notice how the marriage relationship then is compared between Christ's relationship, or with Christ's relationship with the church. And in verse 31, he just says it. He says, For this cause a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and two shall become one flesh. This mystery is great, but I am speaking with reference to Christ and the church. So if we can break the relationship of Christ with the church, then why couldn't we break the husband-wife relationship? And if we can't break one, why should we be willing to break the other? We must continue to nurture our families and defend the biblical concept of marriage and family. It is a biblical foundational doctrine, and we must not give it up.
And the fourth, the last thing I want to talk about today is the gospel was meant to be shared. The last, last message that Matthew recorded with Jesus was the Great Commission. Matthew 28, 18. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given unto me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. These verses are quoted by almost every serious religious Bible student and practiced by few. Practicing the Great Commission is the only way the Lord's Church will ever grow. That was true in the first century. It's true in the 21st century. We have to practice that if the church is going to grow. Uh, that's the reason that we think the FOM uh, classes that we have here and other classes that we have that teach people how to obey the gospel are very important classes. You know, we long for the days when gospel meetings were well attended and filled with spiritual responses to salvation. It would be wonderful if this was still true, but our society has changed. Many years ago, a hundred years ago, uh, gospel meetings were a place to go. People didn't often have many places to go where they could go and associate with other people, and they would take time to go to those. Uh, they were, in some instances, entertainment, so to speak. Uh, spiritual entertainment and for people in former days when our society was was a little more spiritual minded than it is today today we have so many sources of entertainment that we can't even absorb them all uh, both public and t uh, pipe right into our homes and all of these teach us to be fleshly in nature and gospel meetings are boring to people who are fleshly. Let's just face it. These are some of the changes that have taken place in our society. But there are still lots of people in our society that want to go to heaven. They're there. We just need to find them and use whatever means possible to communicate the gospel to them. This is what we are taught to do by the Holy Scriptures. We need a working knowledge of the scriptures in order to do that. And again, that's one of the things that the Fisher's Men class teaches. The church will grow when people are taught. Well, let me draw this to a conclusion. I've mentioned in these two lessons eight foundational doctrines that must not be abandoned if we are to remain the people of God. First of all, God is sovereign. He is the ruler over all things. Secondly, Christ Jesus must be the heart of our teaching. He is the one and only Savior, and we cannot be saved without Him. The Bible is the inspired and arid eternal Word of God. It is our source book. That's what we go to for everything that we do in teaching and doctrine for salvation, uh, in the things we do in the church and in the things we do in our personal life. Christ's church is distinctive and undenominational. Uh, well, I, I think I skipped one. The Bible is the inspired and arid eternal word of God. It is our source book. Maybe I said that. Christ's church is distinctive and undenominational. He established only one. Read throughout the scriptures and he only established one. Baptism is essential to salvation. It is necessary for forgiveness of sins and necessary for us to be saved. Servant leaders are the ones who will change the world. They're the ones who make a difference in people's lives when they lead in that way. And the family must be nurtured and defended. Strong families make strong churches. And the gospel is meant to be shared. One of the last things that recorded, and especially it is in Matthew, that Jesus said was to go into the world and teach the gospel of the whole creation. So the gospel was meant to be shared, but the gospel was also meant to be obeyed. Just teaching it without any obedience to it will not make Christians. I talked earlier about baptism and about the need for uh, repentance 
and about the need for confessing Jesus as Lord and the need for faith in Jesus Christ as God's Son. And if you have these things, then you can be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, and the Lord will add you to his church, and you will receive the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. If you are living for Christ, then you need to live by the word that we have. This holy word, this inspired word, this is what we run our lives by. And if you have moved away from that, let me encourage you to move back. And if we can help you in any of these things, let me encourage you to answer the invitation that we are going to sing at this time. Would you stand, please?